Okay, we're going to be in session number nine. It's titled, God Provides, 2 Kings chapter 7. So session nine, God Provides, 2 Kings chapter 7. Underdogs. Everybody loves underdogs. Think of the movies and books that you have seen or read that involve underdogs. Now, I can be really sarcastic here and say, all you got to do is think about the movie and the cartoon that was called Underdog, <laughs> old enough to remember those. <laughs> Although the movie hasn't been that long ago. But think about other books and movies that involved the story of an underdog. Anything come to mind? Rudy. Rudy. Rudy's one of the ones I wrote down. It's one of my favorites yeah. as an underdog story. Is Rudy, Notre Dame, one, Notre Dame football. Rocky's another one. All four of them. He was always the underdog. What is, what is underdog? Underdog means a guy that is the um, not expected to do well. He's the last. He'd be the last guy chosen for a sports team. He'd be the guy that you'd expect to fail at anything he ever did, and he ends up winning in the end. Oh, okay. So yeah, Rocky, Rudy. I put down Miracle. The, what was it, 1980 U.S. hockey team that beat the Russians? Well, there was the football player right east, and I can't think of his name. I can't think of the other side. Or, yeah. yeah, and he was... Rocky Blyer and, and Gail Sayers? No, no, this was, he, he wound up on the Eagles, I think. And, and, and he was nothing. Oh, yeah. He was just, yeah. he was just a... Yeah, I don't remember. I know the story, but I don't remember the name. Another one, in some ways, would be a league of their own. You remember that movie, the ladies baseball league during World War II. Uh, for books, I wrote down the Lord of the Rings, Frodo, and he was about as big as underdog as you could get. Uh, Oliver Twist, if you want to get classical. Uh, if you have ever seen or read the book Ender's Game, then Ender Wigan, it's a sci-fi classic. And then for all of the younger folks in here, or maybe some of the older ones too, Harry of Harry Potter <laughs> was an underdog in many ways. Last night, uh, Vivian and I were watching a PBS special that we had taped on the um, railroads of Scotland in the episode last night showed where they filmed, for those of you that have seen the Harry Potter films, where they filmed the Hogwarts Express going out of the station and going to the academy, that big trestle that they showed. It's actually a railroad bridge in um, Scotland and evidently it's very popular with tourists. All the Harry Potter fans have to go <laughs> and take pictures of the trains going over that trestle. So underdogs are everywhere. We all like a story where the guy who is not expected to succeed, who is insignificant in probably every way possible, all of a sudden becomes the most important person in the story. Well, our lesson today involves what you could call four underdogs. Four very insignificant, unimportant, people would have shunned them, people who became very important in the uh, breaking of the siege at Samaria. So last week, we had the story of Naaman, the general of the army for the king of Aram, or Syria as it's called today. And if you remember how the story ended, Naaman professed faith in, Christ, in God, the Hebrew God, because of his healing. But he still went back to King Ben-Hadden and became his commander of the army. And Ben-Hadden still had some issues with Israel. 
And as we get into chapter 6 and 7 and 8, it's all about the warfare between Israel, Judah, and Aram, or Syria, the king that had them. Uh, in, ver in chapter 9 of 2 Kings, we find again the story of several kings that were none very good. And we end up in chapter 9 with the finally with the death of Queen Jezebel. And then in chapter 10, we get to the point where they're all losing territory and it's going to end up shortly with Israel actually falling to the Assyrians. Uh, in a couple of weeks, in the latter part of 2 Kings, Israel is actually totally destroyed. And as we get to the end of 2 Kings, Judah is carried off into captivity. But our story today comes out of chapter 7. King Ben-Hadden has again attacked Israel, Israel being the northern kingdom. Uh, he has again captured a lot of cities. In chapter 6, the king of Israel decides that the way to stop Ben-Hadden from attacking his uh, nation is to give him a huge gift or we would call it a bribe. So he takes all the silver and gold from the royal treasury, and he takes the silver and gold objects from the Lord's temple, and he gives them all to Ben Haddon as a gift, I call it a bribe, um, to stop his invasion. And Ben Haddon does for a while. But like all good tyrants, he doesn't say bought for long. In chapter 7, he has come back again. And he has laid siege to the city of Samaria, which was the capital of Israel. And um, they are getting into a very dire situation. The siege has been going on long enough that food's running out, water's running out. And the king blames Elisha for this. Now, real interesting that he blames Elisha because Elisha has been feeding him information from God about where King ben Haddon's army is so that they can avoid them or defeat them. But since they are surrounded, he needs a scapegoat, and Elisha's the scapegoat. It's all your fault, Elisha. You're the one who's caused this problem. So, as we begin chapter 7, the king has sent his right-hand man, his... Um, Chief of the army, I'd almost say. They call him a captain, which doesn't sound very high in the ranking system. But he also is determined as the right-hand man of the king of Israel. So he's an important person. He is, the king has sent him to arrest Elisha because he's the one at fault that they're in such dire straits. So as we begin chapter 7, this is Elisha speaking to the captain who has come to arrest him. So let's look at 1 and 2. Uh, Tom, would you read 1 and 2? Mm -hmm. Elijah replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, Isaiah will be of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two sayas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Samaria. The officer whose arm the king was leading, said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elijah, but you will not eat any of it. Okay. Chapter 7 in the Holman starts off, Elijah said, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. The word Lord in both places is the word that we've talked about before. It's the word Yahweh or the covenant name of God. So Elisha is calling out the covenant relationship that God has with the people of Israel as he starts to speak. And when he says here, in the original Hebrew, this is a plural. So he's not only talking to this captain who has come to arrest him, He's talking to everybody in the country. He's telling everybody, listen up. Or some translations will say behold or hark. 
There's some other word that means pay attention. This is important. Um, this is coming from God. This is coming from the covenant God of Israel. I'm not the one saying it. I'm just the mouthpiece. I'm passing on what's happening. And again, the word for hear talks about not only hearing, but doing something about it. Anytime you hear, or just about any time you see the word hear in the scriptures, it really means hearing it and then acting on what you have heard. Uh, first one goes on to say, About this time tomorrow, at the gate of Samaria, Samaria is the capital city, six quarts of fine meal will sell for a shekel, and twelve quarts of barley will sell for a shekel. I remember a minute ago I said they'd been locked up for a while, food was scarce, water was scarce. What happens when the supply gets small of an object? What happens to the price? It goes, goes up. It goes up. So food was extremely expensive. People didn't have money for it. But notice what Elisha says to the nation. Tomorrow. He's very specific. Tomorrow at this time, so it's not like someday it's going to get better. He's giving them an absolute positive date and time that prices are going to be back to normal again. He's telling them in a roundabout manner, yeah, we're under stress right now. Yeah, the city is surrounded. We're running out of food. We're running out of water. But don't despair. Tomorrow everything's going to be back to normal. What you expect? Verse 2, the captain, the king's right-hand man, so I kind of envision him as one of the commanders of the army, um, responded to the man of God. Look, even if the Lord were to make the windows in heaven open, could this really happen? Who is Elisha speaking for? Lord. He's speaking for the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. So not only is the captain doubting Elisha, he's also doubting God. He's saying, what you're saying is just way too good to be true. It cannot. Even if God were to literally open the windows of heaven and pour out food to us, I would refer you back to the manna from heaven during the wanderings in the wilderness. Even if God was to do that, could we really be back to normal? And Elisha says, you will in fact, so no doubt about it, you will see this happen. But because of your doubt, you will not eat any of it. You have been judged because of your doubt, your lack of faith in what God has said. So you have been judged and you will not enjoy any of what is going to happen tomorrow. Okay, Bert, would you read 4 to 8? <clears throat> no, excuse me, 3 to 8. Oh, yes. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say, We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Armenians and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Armenians. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Armenians to hear the sounds of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled at dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had left the camp reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Okay. Verse 3 in the Holman says, Four men with skin diseases, and yours is New International? NIV, yes. NIV. Mm -hmm. NIV, King James, others identify it as leprosy. 
Think of Neiman last week. Holman called it a skin disease. All the other translations <coughs> called it leprosy. So four men with a skin disease were at the entrance to the gate. They were already ostracized. Remember I said last week, people with skin disease not only suffered physical torment, they also suffered emotional, social torment because they were ostracized. People would not deal with them. So these guys have been outside the gates of the city. They have not been in the city throughout this uh, siege. So they were not able to get any food. They couldn't get into the city. So they're sitting at the city gate and they look at each other and they say, why just sit here until we die? Good question. So they come up with options. Listen to the options. If we say, let's go into the city, we will die there because the famine is in the city. But if we sit here, we'll also die. So option one, let's see if I'll open the door and let us in. Likelihood is they're not gonna let him in because they have leprosy. So you don't want disease as well as everything else coming into the city. So option one is really not much of an option. They're not gonna get into the city. Option two says, let's sit here. Well, we've been here. That's really not a change. We're still hungry. We're still in dire straits. Option two doesn't sound much like a, an option. So option three said, so, okay, what do we got to lose? My words. What do we got to lose? Heard that before? Naaman last week. What do we got to lose, Naaman? Do what the prophet told you. So the peace guys say to each other, what do we got to lose? Let's go over to the Aramians' camp, tents, uh, camp, the enemy, the guys who are surrounding us, who are trying to kill everybody. Let's go over there. If they let us live, if they be merciful to us and let us live, great. If they kill us, we were going to die anyway. It's not a big difference. So it was really the only option that gave them any hope, however slim it was, to... Uh, survive. Uh, when they talk about going over to the tent, in the Hebrew it actually talks about going over and basically prostrating themselves, begging if you will. Take us in. Do, give us mercy. Let us live. So verse 5 says, So the diseased men, the men with leprosy, got up at twilight to go to the Aramians camp. Twilight's important. If they came at night, then the guards could have thought they were spies because it was dark. So they would automatically kill them. At twilight, just getting dark, the guards would have been able to see them, but maybe not see that they had leprosy. So maybe they would have had mercy on four Israelites who were surrendering, not realizing they had uh, leprosy. So they went over to the camp at twilight. When they came to the camp's edge, they discovered that there was not a single man there. There was no guard. That would have been really strange. You come up to a military camp and there are no sentries. You're in a war zone. There are no sentries. That would have been really strange. So oh, they that's came. Scary to me. Or it could be scary. <laughs> it gets scary as they go in. That's right. But it would have been real strange. No guards up. Why? Verse 6, For the Lord had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a great army. And they said to each other, King of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. So they had gotten up and fled at twilight, abandoning their tents, horses, and donkeys. The camp was intact, and they had fled for their lives. So, I guess you could call it mass hallucination or mass hysteria. They heard something nobody else heard. They had to have heard the approach of a huge army coming towards them. It scared them to death. They literally dropped everything they had and fled for their lives. They left the food, they left their equipment, they left their tents, 
And they left everything and just ran for their lives, throwing things off of their cells so they could lighten the load to get not away the, from what they perceived as an attacking army. Not the first time God's caused something like that. No, not the first time. It's not the last either. No, no. Later in the book, he does the same thing when Judas, uh, Judah and Jerusalem is surrounded. So it's not the first time, it's not the last time. He's caused an enemy to hear something that nobody else heard and caused them to flee for their lives in getting the battle over to uh, his people. When these men, referring back to the guys with leprosy, came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent to eat and drink. So no guards. Let's see what's in the tent. Well, again, this army fled probably sitting down to the evening meal. Twilight would have been about the time they would be eating supper. So they sat down for the meal and got scared off and they left all the food. So these guys who had been starving to death now had a banquet, if you will, set out before them. And they had a good time eating. They had a feast. <laughs> then they picked up the silver, gold, and clothing and went off and hid, hid them. They must have went into a commander's camp or something, a captain of the army's camp. I don't think a normal soldier would have had a lot of loot in his camp. Maybe he would have. I don't know. But whatever tent they went into, there were lots of food and there was lots of valuable stuff. So they gathered everything up and went off and hid it. So they are now full and they are wealthy. Talk about a big turnaround for them. Yeah. Um, they came back and entered another tent, picking things up and hid them. So they went back. Okay, first tent was really good. Let's see the second tent. Second tent was good too. Had food, had wealth. So they got some more stuff and went and hid it. So they're now doubly wealthy. And then their conscience kind of started to get the better of them. They had been facing death themselves. They had been ostracized. They had been the poorest of the poor. Now they had wealth. They had food. And their conscience starts to talk to them. So, Beverly, 9 to 11, please. Then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. 11. Okay. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, We went into the Armenian camp, and not a man was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeeper shouted the news and was reported to the palace. Okay. Verse 9 said, Then they said to each other, We're not doing what is right. Their conscience got to them. Um, Today is a day of good news. And good news here just means good news. It's not a reference to the gospel that comes in the New Testament. So they're just talking about, hey, we've got some exciting news, something that's really important that we need to share with other people. If we are silent and wait until morning light, we'll be punished. Let's go tell the king's household. So they went at twilight. So now it's getting dark. They could have waited till morning, but why wait? We might be punished if we don't go share the news that the siege is broken. So let's go do it. The diseased men went and called to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went to the Aramean camp and no one was there. No human sounds. There was nothing but tethered horses, donkeys, and the tents were intact. It's dark by this time. <coughs> Excuse me. It's dark by this time. So approaching the city gates where the guards were, Again, could have caused problems. The guards could have thought they were the attacking army. But they called out to them. And I would assume that their accent, being Israelites, would have been different than the Arameans. So the gate guards knew, okay, these are some of our guys that are telling us. And the good news is, the army's gone. The siege is lifted. There's wealth and food available over in their camp. Verse 11, the gatekeepers called out, and here when they, the word for called out is like an exclamation of surprise or joy. It's not just, hey, it's like, wow, what just happened? And the news was reported to the king's household. So it got relayed to the guy who could do something about it, the king, who, by the way, is asleep back in his bed. Oh. 
Where did they flee to? Get to that. <laughs> uh, Bill, would you read 11 through 15, please? 11 through 15? Yeah. The, gate, the gatekeepers call out and the news was reported to the king's household. So the king got up in the night and said to his servant, Let me tell you what the Armenians have done to us. They know we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the open country, thinking, when they come out of the city, we will take them alive and enter into the city. But one of his servants responded, Please let the messengers take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their fate is like the entire Israel Israelite community will die. Let them, let them, let's send them and see. Where do you want me to stop? 15. 15. The messenger. The messengers took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them out to the Armenian army, saying, Go and see. So they followed them as far as the Jordan. They saw that the whole army they saw that the, they saw that the whole way was littered with clothes, clothes, equipment the Armenians had thrown off in their haste. The messengers returned to the to return and told the king. Okay. King's asleep. Somebody comes in and wakes him up and says, Hey boss, we got somebody at the front gate saying the Armenians have left. The camp's deserted. What's the king's response? He thinks it's a trap. Now I didn't know this, but the commentary says that the king may have been thinking about an episode with Joshua, because when Joshua led the people in to take the promised land in Joshua chapter 8 he actually does what the king's afraid of he actually hides the army makes them think they've left and they open up the gate and the Israelite army goes in and takes the city so he may have been remembering his history but he thinks the uh, Arameans are setting a trap for it <clears throat> they are hiding out there in the bushes waiting for us to open the door and when we go out and find out what's going on they're going to attack and slaughter us all. So we're not going to do this. But again, notice one of the servants responds, Please let messengers take five of the horses that are left in the city. The messengers are like the whole multitude of the Israelites who will die. Let's send them and see. Again, reminds me of Naaman. You know, what have you got to lose, boss? We're all going to die anyway. Let's send out some messengers on five horses. If they get killed, no big loss. They're going to die anyway. But if they find out it's true, we're all saved. So what have we got to lose? Let's send out the messengers and let them go check. So verse 14 says, The messengers took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army, saying, Go and see. So they followed them as far as the Jordan. They saw that the hallway was littered with clothes and equipment the Arameans had thrown off in their haste. The messengers returned and told the king. Look, if you look at your map, from Samaria to the Jordan River is a distance that I, I think it's 20, 25 miles, I think I remember reading. It was a pretty far distance, even on horseback. The whole way it's littered with clothes and equipment and stuff that the army has thrown down to lighten their load so they can get away. So somebody asks, where did they go when they fled? Basically, they're running back to their home. They're heading back to Aramea or Syria. They're hitting the Jordan River and going north back to Aramea or Syria, as we don't know what today. They were running for their lives. They were dropping anything that was going to stop them from running fast. So the messengers come back and tell the king, hey boss, what those guys said is true. There is nothing out there. There are no people there. Verse 16 says, then the people went out and plundered the Aramean camp. They went out, there was food, there was wealth, there was everything they needed to get back to normal. What did Elisha promise from God? Things are gonna be back to normal tomorrow. 
Remember what he told the captain of the guard? You won't eat it. You won't eat any of it. When you go in and read the rest of chapter 7, the king assigns him to crowd control. <laughs> the crowd is so enthusiastic to go out and get food because they're starving. They literally trample him to death. So he doesn't eat any of it. He sees it, but he doesn't get to eat any of it. So again, two prophecies from God through Elisha. Things go back to normal today. The guard, because of your doubt, you're not seeing anything. You're going to end up dead because of your doubt. Four insignificant, unimportant people who bought extremely good news to the people living in the city of Samaria. You thought things were dire, but God saved you. You know, you kind of can take that and flip it to the New Testament. Think of the 12 apostles. They were not exactly the most significant people in society. In some cases, they were hated society. Think of Matthew, the tax collector. The early disciples were insignificant in the political, social, economic status. But they had some awful good news to tell people. And we may not be the most significant people in society today, but we have some awful good news to tell people. We need to take the courage of these four guys and be willing to speak up as Alan's song this morning, Stand Up for Jesus, and his comments to it kind of ties in here. We need to stand up, given the opportunity, and spread the good news in caps that we can be saved. And that is it for today. Comments, ads, anything you'd like to put to it? That's just kind of all the way through the Bible, you know. There, it's surprising to me, going through Kings, how many times I see parallels between the stories in Kings and the stories of the New Testament, where there's similarities, parallels between it. Just, it strikes me as, it's interesting. That's all I'll say. Anybody else? Okay, Jackie, could you close us in prayer? Yes. Heavenly Father, we um, thank you for um, all that you've opened up for us to uh, understand. Lord, we just ask you that you be with each one of us and that we ponder on these things, Lord, as we go out this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.